Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. There's still quite a few people logging in, so we're gonna give them a few minutes to get settled and we'll get started shortly. Thank you. Hello to everyone who's joining us just now. Um, there's still quite a few people logging in, so we're just gonna give an extra few minutes um, and we'll get started. Awesome. All righty. Thank you for being patient, everyone. We are going to go ahead and get started. Welcome and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, How Carriers Are Leveraging Large Language Models and Automation to Drive Better Decisions. My name is Caroline Sue, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. I work on the marketing team here at Indico Data, and I'm excited to be hosting this session. Before we get started with the webinar, I wanted to take care of a few housekeeping items. First, today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand after the live session. We'll be sure to send a follow-up email in the next couple of days with a link to the recording. Please feel free to revisit the content and share it with your colleagues. Next, we'd love to hear from you during today's session. If you have a question for our speakers at any point, please be sure to use the Q&A function and we'll be answering questions at the end of the webinar. If we don't get to your questions today, we'll be sure to follow up afterwards. Now, without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to our speakers today to introduce themselves and get the conversation started. Alex, I'll let you start off. Fantastic, and uh, hello everybody. My name's Alex Taylor. I'm the Global Head of Emerging Technology at QBE Ventures, which is the, the venture and development arm of QBE Insurance. So we've been looking forward to this session for quite some time and, uh, Looking at the, the approach and strategy that, that we as a, an individual carrier, but also this industry is taking to, uh, to embracing this generation of artificial intelligence, particularly large language models, is obviously at the front of everybody's mind, looking at the details as to, to how it might impact the operations we have today and also the things we can do into the future is what matters most. And that's a lot of what we'll be discussing today. So great to be here. <sighs> Great, thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Art Borden. I'm the head of uh, digital business systems and architecture here at Everest. And um, I am too very uh, happy to be here and talking about a topic that's on the forefront of, of many minds these days as we look to implement strategies to help our underwriting community and in other areas of the organization leverage uh, the, the, um, the models that are available to us through AI and, and uh large language modeling. And quite honestly, uh, it's an exciting and uh, uh, rewarding type of thought process that we're going through here as we think about how we can actually simplify and, and provide value to our underwriting community here and uh, uh, how do we best uh, uh, position that uh, capability for them as we move forward. So uh, excited to hear uh, all of the ideas that have come from this session and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Tom. Great. Thanks, Art. Uh, Tom Wild, the CEO of Indico Data. I'll be your moderator today. Um, Indico has developed an intelligent intake solution using a large language model approach, uh, facing primarily uh, the insurance and financial services industries. Uh, so I'm really excited to, to chat with Alex and, and Art today about uh, this topic, which obviously has gone from you know zero to 100 in the last, uh, let's call it uh, 18 months or so. Uh, so a lot to a lot to get into here. 
Um, and I think you'll in, enjoy the, the conversational topics as Caroline mentioned, you know, feel free to put questions into the chat here as we go and, and we'll, we'll take those uh, throughout the, the conversation as well as at the end. Uh, next slide, Caroline. So to get started, you know, I think it, it's helpful to kind of define the, uh, the, the, the drivers. Uh, why is this relevant today in general? Why is automation, digitization, generative AI, why is this uh, suddenly so important and impactful to the insurance industry? So maybe I'll kind of go around the table, but maybe Art, if you could start, you know, given, given your role, what, what kind of economic pressures or economic realities are facing uh, insurers, especially in the property casualty space, that that is causing the the interest to surge in in these digitization and, and transformation opportunities. Yeah, I mean there are so many, but I'll start with the warrant. War for talent is uh, a huge concern, um, and the the cost of of making sure that our talent, not just acquiring it, but they have the skills and expertise necessary to to actually execute in the way that we want in in our underwriting appetite, how we bring them on board, how we give them the tools that they need to to make the decision decisions based on our underwriting uh, appetite and guidelines. All of these particular pieces are, are time consuming and bear tremendous risk for the organization. I mean, as you go out and, and recruit talent and in the marketplace and you go out and, and, and look at how you're going to implement your underwriting appetite and approach the market, it's very difficult to get everyone on the same page these days as far as, you know, what is, for instance, Everest's appetite for a particular Particular risk and what are the risks to us if we uh, get outside of our boundaries and, and acquire customers that maybe uh, we didn't have the right profile for and and those types of things can be very costly for the for the organization and, and making sure that that knowledge base is is becomes part of our internal fabric such that when we actually bring a new underwriter into the fold uh, that they know and, and execute to our strategies and, and AI uh, is a big part of how we think about that for the future because our ability to take underwriting guidance and marry it up to exposure analysis is a really important piece of our future. Would you say, I think that the perception is that, and, and I'm someone who grew up in an insurance family, uh, you know, the perception I think is that historically people who entered the insurance industry stayed there for a long, long time. Uh, and even stayed at, at the companies for a long, long time. Is is that changing now as part of the you know, kind of more social dynamics of of employment? And and has that created some uh, you know some challenges and opportunities around uh, the need to do some of these transformation activities? Yeah, I mean, without question, it, it's a it's a challenge for us as we look for for opportunities to bring people on board, and then the expectations around uh, the next gen of our employee base. Uh, is our their, their expectations are such that there's a technology platform that they're coming into that is uh, very much like the phone-based uh, experience that they have every single day today, where you can you know you can do it, almost anything on your phone, right? And the expectation is is that you know our legacy environment no longer is sufficient for that. We need to to embed knowledge in the in the user base, and um, you know those uh, those folks. That, that don't encounter that kind of environment when they come into our four walls are not going to be here. They, they're they looking for an experience that looks a lot like uh, what they do every day in their life. And, and the complexity of the insurance underwriting cycle is such that it, it takes a lot of work to, to build that uh, in a way that uh, supports how people want to want to work. And, and if we don't marry our capabilities up to their expectations, uh, we're going to lose those folks. And, and on top of the fact that we still have a producer uh, uh, group out there that's looking for quick response times and, and all of the, the best practices that uh, they're used to as well. So uh, it, it, it's, a big, it's a big concern of ours. Alex, when you think about, you know, we'll, we'll use supply chain challenges as sort of a, a catch all there, but talk a bit about changes around you know, or trends in, in sort of combined ratios, cat exposure. How do those play into the need for, for transformation and leveraging some of these technologies? 
Yeah, I, I think the, the underlying theme here is that products are getting more complex. I mean, the expectation, to, to Art's point, on people to understand the increasing complexity across cat and weather risk. I mean, convective storm is a big theme at the moment. Uh, property and material supply chain for property cat. Uh, you know, even supply chain components of some more niche and nascent products like cyber. What we're starting to see thematically is that underwriting these risks has to take increasing amounts of information into account, both on the economic side of remediation on the claim side, but also as we underwrite, what they might have to have expertise in in order to successfully execute that product uh, to maintain a ratio. And, and often this means that underwriters that traditionally are used to working on, on table-based uh, rating models are having to look at risk engineering components. They're having to look at specifics related to materials and compositions of buildings or specific components of cyber risk and cyber or you know, emerging trends in A&H. The, the onus on our people to take all of these in, things into account and almost to be experts into very deep verticals that are going to have material impacts on the success or, or lack of success of a product uh, is enormous. And you know, one of the opportunities we have, particularly in language models, is what I like to call that the co-pilot solution. And this is this is not replacing people; it's acting as a, a second guess, a check. Uh, against a decision or an action that a person's taking to draw their attention to something that might become important, that might be newer to a product or representative of a, of a change that a carrier has made in a product to say, have you considered this? And this piece of information that's on page 175 of the submission, this is why you need to take this into account. And this is the, the impact of that. Now, the, the opportunity, as we'll see in this space, is to normalize the capability of people uh, and that addresses, you know, everything that's on this page. You know, it helps to mature people's skill set within a particular product that they might be newer to or that's changed dramatically to particular economic pressures. And that's around risk selection, particularly. And obviously, that's a, a thematic, particularly in the eastern seaboard of the U.S. and property right now, but also into to supply chain challenges, you know, understanding both on the claim side and the underwriting side, the decisions that you might need to make related to components of a particular market market or a product or, or a combination of the two. The real opportunity we have here is to almost make people superhuman to be able to take all of these things into account because they don't have to spend the time reading through documentation. Their attention can be drawn to the things that are most impactful or material. Perfect. Well, that's great. I think we we nicely set the table for the for the why question, right? So now let's move on to the, the sort of what and how. Uh, so Caroline, if you could advance. Um, so as a, as a group here, we have identified five key considerations to think about in deploying and leveraging, <clears throat> excuse me, large language models um, to, to address some of the, the sort of why issues that we just outlined, if you uh, proceed to the next slide. So Art, um, with, with your role at Everest, uh, maybe I'll, I'll point to you on this one to, to get us started. Um, I think there's tons of excitement around AI and, and generative AI in particular. Um, how do you think about from a, a technology system standpoint, given that, you know, this is a, a, a regulated industry, where does this fall into your mix when, when designing a system uh, to, to address some of the, the opportunities that we have in front of us here? Yeah, I mean, this is a big uh, topic of consideration in, in the states across the country because uh, a lot of what AI does is seen as quote unquote black box and the ability to make it explainable to the regulators that you're actually quoting a piece of business the same way fairly based on a set of risk characteristics for two similar customers is, is critical. If they, if they get a sense that we're uh, somehow embedding or allowing a process to exist that would result in, in differing uh, quotes for a very comparable set of ri uh, risk characteristics, that's going to get that's going to draw a lot of, uh, of problems for you. So that bias and, and engineering bias away and making the system more fact-based and how it how it interprets is, is a big uh, big component of how we think about that. Because quite honestly, that you know it's a, in, in large part a very regulated industry, our ability to use
his systems in, in a very comparable way from customer to customer is kind of mission critical in how we do this. So it gets a lot to how you curate your data, how are you training your models, what is what is that uh, source of of that logic that you're using to to make any sort of decision that's instrumental in the in the ultimate de, uh, pricing decision yeah. has to be something that's repeatable, transparent, et cetera, to be able to stay in compliance with the with state regs. And I and I know the states are very sensitive to this. It's a it's a very common topic for them because as more models come into the industry, they're very concerned about mi uh, misalignment of those decision models. Alex, with your global innovation hat on, um, I'm sure these discussions, you're part of these discussions at the you know very senior level at QBE. How how have you guys talked about where to set that sort of risk reward frontier uh you know because there's clearly it's not risk free um but you need to take some risks to get the reward so in the in the sort of c suite at qbe how how have, how have you guys set that uh, uh that threshold yeah and there are really two words here to underline one of those is auditability and the other one is the ability to uh uh explain to Art's point exactly what's taken place and that's the the input and that's the output right so if you if you look at the way that these models are deployed you know to many particularly to incumbents this is one of the first ventures that they've made outside of the corporate firewall from a security perspective so you know they're consuming something that comes from the outside of an organization if you're consuming you know, gpt4 or, or claude or, or gemini or whatever model it happens to be you know and and yes absolutely there are things that you can wrap your arms around and deploy yourself but if you are consuming a cloud capability being able to demonstrate after the fact, what went into the model, you know, down to the, the individual parameters that, uh, that were supplied, the information that was given to the model, and then also how it responded and, and when it did that, but even down to the version of the model is essential. Because if a question is asked after the fact, you need to be able to say not only why something happened, but also to have the, the oversight component of that to say, I didn't just trust what the machine said, I got a human you know, ultimately, and they're the person that's licensed to do this, that's qualified to do this. I got the human to be the ultimate arbiter of this decision by looking at all of the information that was presented uh, that was presented to them. Particularly, you know, with the case of a large language model, that might be faster than it traditionally was, rather than doing that that page flipping that we talked about before. You know, they might immediately get to page 186 that has the the pertinent information. But the person was still the ultimate arbiter of the decision. As long as you can demonstrate those two things, you know, you know what went in, you know what came out, and can show that a person was ultimately the one that pressed the button on the decision then you're operating in a safe way. We call these guardrails, and they're the not negotiables for participating in this space. It shows diligence and maturity to exploring an innovative space, and it's absolutely essential. It almost gives you an innovation license to be able to do things that are more on the edge here because you're taking a sensible and mature approach to being able to demonstrate that, uh, that you're aware of what's taking place. To put you on the spot a little bit, if if we're on a 10 scale, one being tons of risk and 10 being this is well solved, where do you think we are as an industry with, with this particular question? Yeah, I mean, look, it, it comes down to the level of maturity shown in deployment more than anything. The, the pace of change here is exceptional. And that's something that the insurance industry quite rightly hasn't been built to accommodate by our nature, you know, we are quite conservative organizations. Things have traditionally matured over a period of time. Risks historically remain relatively static. Uh, the macro context here is that, you know, we are in a landscape of uh, dramatically increasing risk, uh, you know, and that's, uh, you know, cat and weather risk, it's cyber risk, it's it's emergence in, uh, in property and material uh, risk, it's even healthcare costs. You know, the way that we're playing into that, of course, is by being a little bit more adventurous in some of the things that we do with our technology solutions. And overall, that's that's a good news story, right? You know, it means that we can show that we're attempting to optimize processes, we're reducing overhead and cost, we're increasing the opportunity for people to participate in the industry itself. Uh, what that means is that even though the risks of the technology are higher, mitigating those risks by being able to show that there are mature processes in place to act as safeguards to those means that it, it's not actually a high risk 
once it's uh, once it's experienced. So the deployment of this technology with those guardrails around the outside makes this a fundamentally safe thing to do. If those guardrails are removed, you start to get into problematic territory. And certainly from what we've seen, both at the, the regulatory level and most of the carriers participating in the space globally, overall, I've been tremendously impressed with the level of maturity shown by an industry, not just in its conservatism and its ability to put guardrails in place, but the industry's willingness to engage in something that is net new. And I mean, to your point before, Tom, the space really has only been engaged in even in the last 12 months, particularly in language models by the insurance industry. And to do anything in 12 months, particularly to get things to production, which some carriers have done, is remarkable. And it's a yep. representation of, of just how seriously the space is being taken. Great. Uh, next slide, Caroline. Art, has the, the role of, let's talk about talent. Has the role of the, the data scientist, the data engineer changed uh, with the arrival of LLMs? And, and if so, how? Yeah, I mean, it's it's emerging. I would just characterize it as emerging. Um, I, you know, I I would say that what um, what it's brought to light and continues to bring to light is the role of sound data governance in the creation of models, right? And that's always been true, but it's even more true as we as we enter into this space. I mean, if you're going to do some sort of private uh, model or some you know sort of hybrid model that you're going to use between your own data and and, and curated data that you're going to join in a joint venture, you you want to be sure that that is uh, well well understood and and so how how your actuaries react to that and how they um, th th they participate in the process and and think through it you know they they uh, they understand and have historically understood the, the role of data in the process uh, and they they um, I think have bought into the this idea that that there are faster ways to get to guidance on certain uh, certain decisions through the models, right? I think that I think that's adopting well. I think there still is the you know the anxiety about data not controlled by me, right? Or have, that came from outside the organization, and the rigor that you have to d employ. You know, all of us who have worked with our actuarial partners to, to implement systems and the and the care and custody that they exert over making sure that that data is correct. There's always the suspicion that maybe their peer companies are not maybe following the same level of rigor, you know, that type of thing. So, so there is some skepticism, I think, out there as far as, you know, where the source of the data comes from and, and how they think through that. And that's something that you have to spend some time getting alignment on to make sure that you sort of break down some of those biases against uh, not invented here type syndromes because so much of our data it continues to, you know, the, the trend is for third party data or other places data, not necessarily our own. And I think that requires a, a level of discipline and understanding where the fault lines are and things that that we control ourselves pretty effectively versus things that are coming from the outside. And how do you how do you balance the two? And I think I think that that does create some anxiety, right, because you no matter no matter what, you know, many cases, you're not going to get the level of confidence in, in some of the third party data sources, for instance, that you might rely upon and such, uh, because you know that they're not perfect either. So your your level of anxiety over whether I'm getting the right answer or not goes up the more of that you, you, you employ. But at the end of the day, does it align with our historic patterns and does it generate a, a profitable result for us? I think the, the longer people work in that space, the more comfort they'll have with it. But I think it does take some time to get over that learning curve. Alex, when you when you think about the talent side of this, I mean, there's a lot of discussion around citizen data scientists, the fact that prompting is something anybody can do, right? You don't need to know Java or, or C Sharp. You know, you can wake up tomorrow and if you know uh, how to write a sentence, you, you are effectively programming uh, the computer. How do you think about the, the, the right engagement with the employee base uh, to enable them with this kind of uh, capability versus the, you know, the, the controls and the training that, that may be required to have them be successful with it? 
Yeah, and it's such an important question. I mean, look, I'm I'm a data guy going back decades. Uh, I I you know, live and breathe technology, as you know. The, the interesting thing to me here is the democratizing power of a language model to help people that traditionally haven't been in the data sphere be able to have exposure to and access to it. And you know, as much as people are writing sentences, as much as you know, prompt engineering is emerging as a skill, fundamentally, we do have to remember that people that are prompt engineering are essentially changing and modifying the model weights of a machine learning model. I mean, it's in the end, it is a neural network. Uh, you know, the transformer architecture is still just a machine learning model predicting the next word fundamentally. Uh, what we're doing is giving people access to tremendous capability that in many cases they, they don't naturally understand because they're not data people. So, you know, yes, you're modifying a sentence. Yes, you know, that does transform the behavior of the model itself. What we have to remember is that because people are entering this capability space without having understanding necessarily of the, the needs for, for data privacy, the, the needs for, uh, for understanding the flows of data, particularly outside an organization, we have to pay more attention to the training side to make sure that people that don't come from that space understand the implications of the actions they're doing. Having said that, you know, we are entering a golden age of data. Uh, insurers are traditionally data hoarders, but a lot of the data that we, we hold isn't actively usable because it's in an unstructured form. Uh, yeah. What we're now seeing is that we're able to take a lot of this historically archived unstructured information and to automate the extraction of that in a structured form to insert into a traditional data analytics pipeline. Uh, and that could revolutionize an understanding of historic loss. It could revolutionize a, an understanding of the creation of new rate tables by being able to automatically read risk engineering reports, for example, and, and uh, rerun scenarios to determine what you could have done differently 12 months ago to, uh, to underwrite more effectively. Now, all of these things used to cost a fortune, uh, and in many cases they weren't done because you can't afford to, to have a 1,000 data scientists doing that work consistently. Now you might be able to. So the opportunity for the industry to transform itself because a lot of things are suddenly dramatically cheaper is immense. And I, I strongly suspect that over the next several years, we're going to see a lot of in, uh, insurers, a lot of uh, insurance industry participants doing scenario analysis to improve the quality of their underwriting because they can optimize the, the access to their data, both through sort of citizen uh, engineers but also by giving access to the traditional data engineers much more data than they historically would have had. Yeah, perfect. Uh, well, a good segue, uh, Caroline, to the next slide. Um, so, Art, right, let's talk about human in the loop, you know, the bionic arm, the co-pilot, you know, these, these sort of analogies. Um, why is it important? Um, is straight through processing in the conversation? What's, what's the expectation we should have about large language models? making you know complex sort of augmentation or even decisioning around important things like underwriting and claims i still believe there's a continuum uh from the size of risk kind of perspective right so for uh smaller smaller um size risks uh smaller exposure base that you have a, a, a continuity and such of the the exposure, and it's a lot easier to still use kind of a straight through processing approach. You know, when you get to complexity in the middle, upper middle, and large account space, I still believe that you have a greater reliance on um, a human centric approach to the process now. Are there chunks of that work that can be taken into uh, a, a large loss model kind of uh, a large language model kind of approach? Absolutely, right? So on the submission intake side, it's really important in terms of just digesting the sheer the sheer quantity of, of a submission, right? There's so much information and it's such that it's very difficult for an underwriter to actually consume all that comes in on many submissions. And quite honestly, that that just grows geometrically as they go to do the risk assessment uh, uh, side and having some capabilities to say, 
call on uh, knowledge management for underwriting guidelines and throw that up against some of the some of that submission work to flag items for the underwriting community for them to, to run those down is a, is a very valid use case and very powerful use case because quite honestly, how do you expect a human being to know all the permutations and combinations of all the types of business that you're expecting them to be accountable for in their underwriting process? It's just not possible. So these tools are extremely valuable, but but the result, and when I go to put that proposal together for, for my producer, if I haven't had someone kind of looking at that, I'm, I'm uncomfortable, right? I, I, I really still think that uh, there's too much cross-pollination in some of the models. You really do need a person with some savvy about that, that, that risk to be able to accurately hang a price off of it. And, and those types of uh, items are still going to require uh, human intervention in the process. But I think there's chunks of work that, that happen in the life cycle of the submission that, that really can benefit from this. You know, risk reading, risk engineering reports, Alex called that one out. That's actually another area that, uh, you know, you can do quite a lot of work with. And and so I think it's stitching together the right set of capabilities in the near term. Uh, I don't think you're, we're in a position where you're going to dump that whole submission into a uh, into a, a set of models and come out with a result on the other end. The complexity is still too great. Uh, but like I say, for smaller size risks, I think that remains possible. And oh, by the way, go fix and ad address the things that you can in the life cycle of the process and go, go address those and wait a bit until you feel more comfortable. You've got your your sea legs in terms of uh, implementing those models and in, in some of the uh, the touchier decisions around pricing, etc. Alex, is there and and, and I'll, I'll keep bringing up risk as we go through this because there 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 still are some some risks really to think about. Are there risks that the end users of these become overconfident in what they're seeing because the results? seem very reasonable, right? The, they're designed to generate, you know, plausible language. In the human loop, is, is that a risk that we need to be more uh, uh, sort of specific about, you must review this and check check it off rather than just trust? How, how, do, how do you think we balance that? Yeah, and look, I mean, to your point, it's important to remember what a language model is. They're incentivized internally to respond and they do sound very plausible even when they are wrong. You know, what we're starting to see is, a, I'll call it an immune system evolving around the outside of this technology. So, you know, early systems that I've seen deployed in production in this space and in insurance, every time an underwriter logs into a system, they have to click a button saying that I accept that it's my licensed responsibility to review the input information, not just the decision of the machine prior to me making a decision, not the machine. And, you know, that, that kind of safeguard is important because in the end, a language model is just a product of the technology that it's built on. Uh, you know, if we compare a language model to a, a human in a team, you know, in the end, you could turn to your intern and ask them to make a reserving decision for a major cat, but you probably wouldn't. Or even if you did, you know, you're going to go and validate their work and make sure that that's something that stands up to scrutiny. In the same way, you know, if we consider these models, dare I say it, a, as a member of a team, we have to consider the context and the construct under which they operate. In the end, yeah. teams make decisions collaboratively. You know, there are managers whose job it is to have oversight and responsibility for those decisions. It's no different here. In the end, you don't simply trust something because it happens to open its mouth and respond any more than you would with a human, uh, knowing the level of experience and understanding they have of the nuance of the risk itself. And these models are newer. Often they are general. They don't have foundation training on either insurance data or your company data. Having said that, you know, they can. And there are organizations that are specializing in refining models uh, on on your data, on your internal decisions, both historically and current, that might guide them to be more like a member of your team and to behave more like someone that works for your organization. I think the future is very bright in that space, and it's probably still too early to tell exactly how effective that's going to be. But as we move from these, these general models like GPT-4, for example, to, you know, models being trained on your company data, I expect we'll see a dramatic uptick in uh, questions like, can we rely on the decision made by this model? Uh, and running these things in parallel to human decisioning will be a big part of that. 
I suspect we're going to start seeing these things running in, in shadow mode. And after a year, someone's going to say, hey, you know, have you noticed that this model's made the same decision that our human team has every single time, but it's taken, you know, 10% of the time and it cost a thousandth as much. You know, they're compelling arguments to start trusting these things a little bit more if they stand up to scrutiny. I think it's a fascinating study in human decisioning, you know, even at the beginning of sort of enterprise AI, maybe five years ago, I, I remember having many experiences uh, in, in this regard where customers would, would, would rightly ask about accuracy, right? I mean, that, that's kind of the first question people ask. But what became clear was that um, while AI allows us to have very fine-grained metrics like precision and recall and all these great metrics, when tried to apply to a, a traditional human decisioning workflow, no one had ever compiled those metrics. So there was no baseline. The second thing that was really fascinating is when it came time to, to train models to capture the understanding of the enterprise as it relates to how a decision was going to get made. And you had five or 10 people doing the job, get around the table and start to label data. Um, you would find huge variances across the way the five of them would, would look at the same exact you know, documents or, or, or use case. So it's, it's really forced a lot of introspection, I think, into how decisions have been historically made and, and how, to, how to make those you know, more uh, sort of durable and, and consistent. Yeah. I, I, I have to add on to that, Tom. I mean, I think it's uh, train the model on what exactly. If you don't have your own internal decision frameworks locked down, uh, what are you, how are you measuring your model, right? And there, you know, appetite in my mind is a very common one. Oh, you know, you'd find underwriters could write anything, right? They believe they could write any piece of business that came in the door. They could, they could put the right exclusions and, and limits sure. and forms on it to get, to get there. That's not where the organization wants to be. They want they they're they're picking their their places to play, and getting that alignment up front because then you want your model to react to that. But if you haven't even established that yourself, so I you know while there's a rush to try to use the technology, uh, you know I think we underplay how much work it takes on you know behind closed doors to get to the right decisions about what we want that model to actually do and what the results are so that we can properly measure it. And, and I think that's a, people don't recognize how much work that really is because getting people to agree on, on many of these topics is, is an all day job. So, so it's really something that, that people have to pay attention to as they think about this, because you got to know what you want to try to deliver and, and what efficiency or other, otherwise you're sort of automating some chaos out there uh, with without actually delivering the value that you're looking for. Well, this is a, a wonderful segue to the next slide, uh, which is how to drive change management. So Alex, what, what have you seen be critical and, and slash successful in getting these technologies adopted? Because I think what often happens is well-intentioned automation projects get kicked off. And at the very, very end, the end users are brought into the conversation and they're like, whoa, you know, this is not how it actually works. And I would never use this. And, and you know, in an extreme case. So how have you had success at, at QB, especially in your role, you know, making sure that change management, change management is part of these conversations? Yeah, and it's such an important question. I mean, if, if there's one word you could use to describe technology in insurance, it's not fast paced. Uh, and that's that's by intention. Uh, you know, I've, I've worked for, for several carriers that have, you know, very successful and functional mainframes that were built in the 70s that are still used to manage multi-billion dollar portfolios. And that's that's fine. Uh, you know, sometimes it can cause integration challenges, particularly with you with newer you know, digital technologies, you know, getting getting things like that on the Web, of course. But if there's one constant in the AI space and particularly in the language model space, it is change. Uh, I mean, if you look at starting a new project built around something like GPT-4 at the moment, chances are by the time you get that to production, even if that's only three months, that a new version of the model will be released, you know, and you have to have a good regression testing framework. You have to have the ability to, to move between model versions to, uh, to make sure that things still perform appropriately <clears throat> on a new version of the model compared to where it was when you started. But you know, making sure that that fits in with the, uh, the, the people architecture 
the, the way that they want to consume the system that they interact with, both on the, the underwriter side, the claim side, even the customer side. Uh, and there are certainly very public examples of the pitfalls you can fall into when you make wrong decisions there. Uh, I mean, not to impugn any particular example, but to, to quote one in the media at the moment, you know, the Air Canada example is particularly fascinating right now of you know, what not to do uh, when you get excited around a technology. And in that case, you know, exposing a, a chat bot to, uh, to your customer complaints line that ended up giving a response that became legally binding. You know, and this is the kind of thing that we uh, we have to consider very carefully. Again, you know, it goes back to the human in the loop side and, and lots of other considerations. But you know, even deploying the technology itself, if you don't set it up to be accommodating of constant change, you're going to find yourself rewriting, recreating from scratch every time. And you might be tempted to simply throw the technology in the bin because it appears too complex. If you set things up appropriately, though, if you engineer them to be able to change model versions, to, to re-prosecute questions that you're asking the system to confirm you know, appropriate response, appropriate extraction of information, you can be very successful. But that's a very different type of system architecture and process architecture than many carriers are used to. The other option is, of course, you can you can outsource the problem. You can find a partner that that is very adept and aware of uh, of the landscape of technology in uh, in LLMs and in AI in general, and consume their capabilities. Essentially, you're consuming technology change management as a service alongside the AI itself. Yep. All right. I know that Everest has spent you know the last year working on several big automation projects, uh, some of which in the underwriting area. What what's the well, some lessons learned around change management. How how have the the consumers of of those processes reacted and, and adapted to to those deployments and, and those innovations? Yeah, it, it, and I alluded to it before. You know, it, it, I'll talk again about appetite. Um, that's an area that's pretty rich right now for us. And you know, there's questions that the underwriting community comes forward with about the whys, right? And are are there decisions being replaced by a machine kind of thing, which is sort of like the, the classic uh, concern about, you know, the automation will take over my jobs. And in, in my mind, in, in no way is that happening uh, so fast, but you know, this is the, this is the stuff you read in the press. But, uh, you know, there's a certain amount of mistrust of the output, right? That's the, that's the kind of stuff that you have to hit on. And, you know, the, uh, you know, you get internally to questions around, you know, changing roles of my job and, and what do I need to do? And you, and you do sort of have to hit that head on because the rumor mill could be pretty brutal uh, around what, what you're attempting to do. In my mind, you know, some of the things that have been important to us is having a strategic roadmap, making sure that we've got the resources in place. There's a funding mechanism. There's a budget. There's a timeline about what you're trying to uh, to deliver, a tightly controlled scope of what you're trying to deliver. That breeds transparency. That that cuts down on, on uh, uh, questions that people pose about what is the purpose of this and, and whether it's adoptable and, and what comes next and so on and so forth. And, and that kind of rigor is pretty important, right? And it also helps the teams that are building some of this to know that there is a life to this, that there's a predictable predictability in what they're going to build moving forward, what they're chasing. All of those things are, are important considerations for a team as well. So there's a lot of change management issues here. Some is the consumption of the output of the models, but some of it is the roles that people play in sure. the building of this and how that will drive their careers forward and, and what that looks like. And there's so much indecision about where this will land in the future that having that and curating that along the way to make sure that people understand the path that you're on is, is pretty important too. Hmm. Great. Uh, Caroline, next slide. So uh, last last topic here, always a really important one. You know, at Indigo, we talk about the three S's, safe, secure, scalable, safe being trustworthy. We've talked about that quite a bit through the first uh, the first four considerations woven in there. But let's talk about scalability and security. I think that in part, you know, probably security has been more addressed at this point. You know, again, Alex, to your point, we're maybe 12 months into this, right? Um, scalability, not so much yet. So um, Alex, maybe we'll start with you. Uh, 
it's been a little bit, uh, I'll kind of set the set the table. It's been quite amazing to watch in just 12 months, a, a pretty sea change in a willingness to adopt a fundamentally cloud solution, large language models, virtually all of them operate, you know, within some kind of hyperscaler infrastructure. Um, where it, it's it, that's been a huge catalyst to, to cloud acceleration from from my where I sit. Talk talk about that and and how how you've thought about the security piece of this at QB, and then we'll kind of come back to scalability. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, to sort of address both of them in parallel. Uh, I mean, obviously, as I said before, a lot of carriers traditionally haven't been big consumers of cloud services. Now, that's not just a lack of willingness to do so. It's the complexities of integrating a cloud architecture into infrastructure that has to remain very regulatory compliant. You know, there is a lot of consultation to make sure that appropriate risks are taken into account at all stages of transformation programs like that. But this generation of AI is seen as too important for people to simply rely on the the old adage that you know cloud is too hard, I'll, I'll stick with the big iron that I'm used to. Uh, but to your point, you know that means that suddenly a lot of information that traditionally has stayed inside an organization has to flow to a cloud provider. And you know understanding where that data is, how it's appropriately safeguarded, you know, is it still in the jurisdictions that I need to operate in, and is that something that my regulators are happy with? You know, and particularly to, to multinational carriers like QBE, you know, we have to think about that in, in 26 different countries. And that's something like 60 different regulators for those that have state based regulators. So there is a lot of complexity in doing this appropriately. We've seen a lot of maturity in larger cloud vendors from helping carriers to address some of these considerations and concerns and often you know, going to the table alongside a regulator, you know, with a technology vendor that's done all of the work to say, you know, this is how it's secured. This is why it's fundamentally safe. Here's the evidence of that. It's a lot easier when your technology partners can table that for you alongside, obviously, the, the appropriate uh, internal technology security and governance controls. But you know, looking at the other side of this uh, and sort of maybe art leading into a, a discussion on the scalability side, it's important to remember that the big cloud-based models and you know GPT-4 is a great example. And this runs on expensive hardware. You know, an NVIDIA H100 card costs forty thousand dollars, and you need somewhere between ten and fifteen of them to run a single request in GPT-4. What's fascinating to me is that we're seeing sort of two sides of the market emerge simultaneously with almost equivalent capabilities. On one side, you've got these behemoth models. They run into, you know, in some cases, the trillions of parameters. They've got massive context lengths. Gemini Pro, which was released last week, is a great example of this. You know, being able to feed a thousand pages of information at once from a model with, with perfect recall is extremely tempting. But on the other side, you know, we're seeing these quantized models that might only run into the 60 to 70 billion parameters that you can run on consumer grade enterprise or enterprise hardware that's dramatically smaller that you can refine on your own data and potentially even operate for yourself. So, you know, I I don't know yet which of those two extremes is going to be the most prominent in the insurance sector. I suspect we're going to see a balance, though. You know, in some cases, consuming a massive model that can take vast amounts of context into, into account for a request is, is going to be very attractive. But on the other side, a, a dramatically smaller model that might only be able to perform one thing but do it really well and pay attention to appropriateness of task based on your company's information might also be attractive, especially if there's a security consideration where you might not want your data to lead the organization at all. I think we've lost your audio, Tom. Ooh, I think we may have lost Tom. Yep. Maybe Art can follow on from that. While we yeah, so I would just say that, you know, from a technology scalability perspective, I don't get too heavily involved with that. But, but I think the approach that we're taking is, is kind of twofold. One is that we think the market will solve some of these scalability issues um, and that we'll be able to leverage some of those future advances as we move forward. So let's play in the areas where we can uh, use the tools that exist today and let some of that mature because we have a lot of internal learnings 
a lot of internal infrastructure, people infrastructure that we need to build to be able to effectively uh, use these tools. And there's lots of applicability within the enterprise. It's a question of where and how do you set those priorities? So I don't know that it's so much a concern of ours in terms of, you know, the sheer volume of data that we have to manage as much as let's not get ahead of our ski in terms of trying to launch too many projects or have have our applicability be too wide in the organization to even support all of the wishes that people have in the process. There's there's a discipline we think we need around this this question uh, to to sort of keep us out of the mess of you know, got too much going on at once and are, are unable to satisfy anybody in the process. So, so we're keeping our scope, we're trying to keep our scope somewhat manageable. Alex, uh, yeah. do I have you back? I think I do. Yep, yep. I got you. Yep. Great. Uh, I had uh, a, a customer actually sort of challenge me a bit on the carbon footprint of these super large language models. And curious, you know, I know that like most major insurers, QB has a very, uh, you know, progressive stance, firm stance on, on carbon impact globally. How do you think about that? And how, how, how should the market think about that? Yeah, it, it's a really important point. And I mean, it's important to remember that the hardware that supports the LLM revolution has almost entirely been enabled by extremely power hungry devices. I mean, NVIDIA has done a, an amazing job in the last 20 years of scaling up the hardware that uh, that effectively has enabled this generation of AI. But, you know, you're talking about infrastructure that requires over a kilowatt of, uh, of power uh, multiplied by 10 to 15. So you know, one thing that excites me is the goals of the major cloud vendors. I mean, Amazon, Microsoft, Google all have you know, very firm views on the carbon neutrality of their operations. And a lot of the time you know, being able to go hand in hand to market both with a, you know, an adventurous AI strategy, but to demonstrate that, you know, even though it might cost a little bit more, that you're offsetting all of the emissions as a result of the use of that technology is extremely attractive. But I mean, also one of the things that that really interests me in this space is the way that you know, for all that you know, this hardware is expensive energetically to run. The opportunity on the ESG side is actually quite high. So using language models to extract information from corporate ESG reports to look at portfolio-wide emissions is a use case that I saw quite recently. So you know, in many ways. Uh, this is also enabling a greater understanding of the implications of portfolio level emissions and, and ways to address that. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, well, we are through our five recommendations here, so we can now turn to Q and A. Uh, Caroline, if you've got uh, some questions queued up, I think we've got a, a good, uh, you know, seven to ten minutes here. We can take questions. Yep. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alex, Art, and Tom. Really enjoyed the session. Um, so like Tom mentioned, we'll now open up the floor to Q&A. So um, feel free to use the Q&A function in your control panel to drop any questions. Um, we actually had a couple of questions come through throughout the session, so we can go ahead and get started. So first one is, is Gen AI the right approach for every use case? When does discriminative make sense versus generative? So Alex, do you want to try that one? Yeah. I'm happy to start with that one. So, look, I guarantee that we're not going to see one model eating the world, right? Language models are highly useful, but in many cases, models that are dramatically smaller uh, are much more effective and also much more uh, operationally efficient to run. I mean, look at the uh, the auto insurance space. You know, there's been some models for a number of years that can look at a picture of a, a motor vehicle and make an assertion as to the level of damage. You know, yes, you know, a multimodal language model could do that task, but you're going to use a uh, hundred times the power and cost. Uh, and even elapsed time to do that versus something that might be a fraction of the size. What we're starting to see is models operating in concert. Language models are quite good orchestrators, so-called tool users of, uh, of other models. Uh, OpenAI has some great examples of this where effectively it, it outsources a job that it could have a good go at to a model that it's been handed as something that it can use, just like a human would use a calculator. Now, OpenAI 
uh, has created a language model that can do mathematics. You know, it can't do that because LLMs can do maths. It does that because it writes code in Python to, to solve the same problem. So, you know, it's always going to be a varied landscape and, you know, language models for all of their utility are not going to be the be all and end all of data science. Awesome. Thank you. Um, next question that's come in. How should I think about building solutions to our use cases versus buying a solution? Yeah, Eric, why don't you, why don't you want to tackle that one? The, the, the build versus buy is a hot topic right now. Yeah, it is. I, I mean, I think, it, again, I'll go back to the data question. Um, you know, are you in possession of the right and the right quantity of data to make the decision, right? And, and you have to give some thought to that because quite honestly, um, you may need to supplement your knowledge base and go outside your organization if you don't feel like you've got the right the right mix of, of the decision data that you're going to want to consider in your model. So, you know, there are times where you've got everything you need and, and you can get after it. But there are other times where you know that you're going to benefit from having um, a bigger pool of of uh of background information to help with that decision and that you're looking for that scale of perspective that you're looking to, to build into the model. So, you know, it, it's a uh, it's an analysis of what are the components that make up the decision is the is the uh, content that you have internally capable of supporting it. And with that analysis, it'll sort of lead you to an answer, I believe. Alex, with your with your investment hat on, obviously you're investing in potential vendors how does that play into the, the QBE strategy? Yeah, and look, the place that I start in this space is, is to say that almost anybody can build good capability in this space, but it's your ability to continue to maintain and evolve it that matters most. So, I mean, retrieval augmented generation is the term you'll hear a lot here. And that's essentially the thing that enables document summarization and question answering. It's it's so simple to build now that you could you could hand that task to an engineer in most companies and they'll have it by the afternoon. If you want to, to Art's point, if you want to, to use your data, if you want to continue to evolve that, if you want it to be defensible from a regulatory perspective, it starts to become extremely challenging. And you can rapidly walk into an unmaintainable mess uh, that uh, that gets very expensive very quickly. And look, some organizations might want to, to pursue that strategy. You know, you do have to throw money and people at it, but it is solvable. A lot of the time, however, bringing a vendor in that's done this several times before, that knows the pitfalls, that knows the regulatory space, is a lot simpler and more cost efficient at the same time because you don't have to build that capability from scratch. I mean, yes, all of the considerations we talked about today come to the fore. You know, knowing you know it, it's 10 p.m. Do you know where your data is? Kind of questions. No, it's uh, it's highly important to make sure that you're putting appropriate safeguards in place, but. Often, it's a more sensible choice to bring in from the outside, not just technology, but expertise in deploying it. Yep, great. Caroline, other questions? I know we're just about at time here. Yep, uh, we'll go to one final question before we end. Um, so this one's around timing. Um, so this person has asked, is it now, should we initiate a POC um, or should we wait until the technology matures? Alex, or, or sorry, or rather, uh, how have you thought about uh, you, you guys have already leaned into this. So how, how, how have you thought about that experience between early adoption, mainstream, et cetera? Yeah, and, and I'm going to say some of what I've already said about that is, yeah. is uh, do I have do I have confidence that the that I understand the answer I'm trying to get to? in the problem that I'm trying to solve first, right? So it, would I know the definition of success uh, yeah. before I get started? And if I think I know the definition of success, well, that's a big part of the, the work that you have to do, right? So now I know what, what I expect the model to deliver for me. And now the question becomes, can I take what I have in terms of internal assets or is there an available source out there? Is there an available model partner that I can go to that could ha help answer that? And if, if the answer is yes, then you sort of have your answer. Do your POC, try to get your estimates in place as far as what that's gonna cost and get some firm timelines on what you're trying to do there because these things have a tendency to expand in scope, 
right? You, you end up tr trying to answer more questions than what you set off to try to answer as people realize, oh, well, I could get this answer, I could get that answer. You really have to be careful but not letting that get away from you because you can you can delay your implementation. You know, implement fast, succeed, keep going. Implement fast, succeed, keep going is really kind of the mantra that we're sticking to. Yeah, I can't emphasize what you said enough. I think that, you know, the, the, the place that we always start with a customer is what data determines success and what criteria determines success. If you have those two together, you're, you're off to the races because now you can design backwards and, and, and get there. Uh, Alex, uh, l last thoughts for, for the webinar here? Yeah, look, I think the most important thing to understand for any participant in the industry is to understand how quickly this might be done to you. You know, so don't necessarily, you don't necessarily have to deploy something to production. Picking a problem that's important to you, uh, both, you know, commercially and tactically, and then looking at how, how easy or, or not it is to do with the technology in this space is important to understand the implications of what your competitors might be doing. And if that's something that's that's relatively quick, that's relatively easy, that's relatively inexpensive, then that means that you have to pay very close attention to it. Because if you don't, you could rapidly find that your position in market is taken in, in a matter of months. And you know, 2024 is going to be the time we start seeing carriers pop their heads up and point to what they're doing. And it might just be something that you're doing and depend on for your commercial success. Great. Uh, excellent final thought. Well, Art, Alex, thanks for the conversation. Really enjoyed it. Uh, hopefully, uh, the audience uh, found it useful. It looks like we had a really terrific retention throughout the uh, the webinar of the participants, so always a good sign. Uh, so thanks all for joining. Uh, as Caroline mentioned, uh, we will have a recorded version of this uh, available subsequent to today. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good one. Bye.